church. Good morning, Tom. It's good to be with you and worship with you this morning. Uh, we have a, a lot going on today and then also next Sunday. Uh, a couple of things to share with you um, the, uh, in, in the way of announcements, and then we will get to our awarding of the, um, of the Heritage Fund. Uh, first of all, following this service today, there will be a potluck down in the basement. And um, that, uh, even if you did not bring anything, there is always plenty of food. There is more than enough down in the basement. We'd love to have you stay and uh, to fellowship with us after the service this morning. Uh, so uh, please, and if I forget, um, help me to remember when I, when I give the benediction to pray over the food, because you guys will stand down there forever, because uh, I got a meeting right after the service today, so make sure we get that, that done before we go down, all right? Next Sunday, um, as you know, we will be having a special uh, Memorial Sunday uh, service. Uh, the, the theme will be We Remember. Um, it is a Sunday in which we, uh, we remember and hold uh, dear in our uh, lives those who have passed on in our lives, uh, family members, uh, close family members, uh, etc., that have uh, passed on. And so we're using the Memorial Day weekend. Memorial Day is on Monday, which is our nation honoring those who have given their lives in service. Uh, we, will, um, we will take Sunday and uh, memorialize those who have uh, gone on before us. So it'll be a very uh, special service. Uh, over on the table is a list uh, that you may sign uh, if you would like your loved one uh, remembered in the service. So over on the table, it's a blue sheet, I believe. I think we have, I don't know, somewhere in the name of in the neighborhood of 60 or 70 of those uh, names. And so you can add that to that. We will recognize them in the service. Our service will have uh, uh, some movement to it, a lot of special things with it. Mary Arps will be here. Um, we will be singing hymns as a congregation. Uh, we will have special music and then a special time of remembrance as well. So we are looking forward to that. We put in the work. I have some volunteers uh, that have um, said yes and some who have not been forewarned yet. So I'm, I'm asking you now in front of everybody, so how can you turn me down um, if I ask you now? But after the service this morning, right up here at the table, if you would, I need to see uh, Rick and Liz, and I don't see them here today, so I'll get their stuff to them. They've already said yes. Jim Johnston, I need to see you. Victoria, after the service, can I see you up here? All right. Uh, Andrew Burkholt. Okay, uh, Andrew Gallagher, Matthew Hall, is Matthew here? I'll need him, there you are, okay. You're, you're, you're flying the ship today, huh? Okay, I need to see you after the service, okay? I need to see Bruce and Jana and Julie, all right? So if I can see you right after the service, talk to you a little bit about what we're doing, what your role will be in the service. Uh, those of you who have readings, I will give you your scripts to read and, um, and the bulletin so you can kind of see where everything is and we can kind of, then I, I need some ideas uh, from you as far as what we do as well. So that will take place right after the service. I'll be a little late getting down to the potluck um, but uh, you're welcome to start uh, without me. You probably didn't need that permission, did you? <laughs> the preschool graduation is this Thursday, <clears throat> um, and we have been asked to provide uh, some cookies for that, for the parents and the little ones, for the celebration they have afterwards. I noticed I think there are five ladies who have signed up to bring cookies. If anybody else would care to join in on that, if you would sign the list, that would be great and then bring your cookies sometime through the day on that Thursday. Finally, um, what I want to announce is the card of the week. This, um, uh, the card of the week is for Megan Yarnell. Uh, Megan gave birth to a little baby girl uh, named Ava Marie 
who uh, was born at 31 weeks, so she's like nine weeks uh, premature. Uh, Ava Marie has spinal bifida, and so she is in the hospital down in Cincinnati, uh, in the children's hospital. She's already gone through some surgery. Things are um, <clears throat> uh, looking encouraging for her, but you can imagine at 31 weeks, I think she's like four pounds, one ounce, something like that. So she remains down there, and Megan is down there uh, staying at the Ronald McDonald house, okay? So all of this has kind of happened, and uh, we are now able to let you know as a congregation. So anyway, the card of the week is for Megan, and uh, our, our, our congregation's well wishes to her uh, as she goes through this with her little one and in support of her. And uh, so we would appreciate it if you would take time to stop at the card there and uh, wish her uh, your uh, best wishes. Is there anything else this morning that we need to announce? If not, I'd like Philip and his group to come forward and take care of our uh, awarding of the Heritage Fund. I look better in the bright light right now. <laughs> Presbyterian Heritage Education Fund Grant. As this name implies, this fund is not a scholarship, nor is it a loan as it has been in the past. It is a grant and aid established in 1997 to be awarded to our members or to children of our employees who are pursuing a higher education than high school. A BS and or associate's degree at accredited colleges, universities, technical colleges, and community colleges and hospital-based nursing programs is the goal for all that have asked to apply. They are asked to complete and submit an application by April 15th of that year and submit a current high school or college transcript of grades. This is just to make sure that they are full-time students. They are then interviewed by our committee, who this year consists of Dr. Sarah Weaver, Jack Schrader, Philip Ebertal, and yours truly. Applicants who meet all criteria will share in the grant funds for that year. The session of the church annually reviews these grants and sets the amount to be given. Later then, the students are asked to be present in the church to receive acknowledgement of their pursuit and will receive at a later date a check from the church in the amount of the grant. We are asked to support this fund by contributing or by leaving a bequest to, these, to this fund uh, any time during the year. The committee is very proud of these students and on behalf of the congregation, we offer our love and support for their continuing effort to be the best that they can be. I'll now ask the rest of the committee to come forward to present this year's grant. I'd also like to invite Andrew Burkhold up as he is our recipient of the grant. Andrew just finished his second year at Ohio State University. Um, Andrew's plans after his undergrad is to go on to dental school for four more years and then three more years to become an orthodontist. Um, this past school year, Andrew talked about struggling with organic chemistry, but also enjoying sign language as his foreign language and he has one semester left until he re, uh, gets that requirement. Um, this summer, Andrew is learning to be a dentist at Dr. Carpenter's office here in Napoleon. There he is learning to be an assistant right now and also sterilizing equipment. So if we could give a, Andrew a round of applause, please.
Would you please join me in our call to worship? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? You are holy. All the earth will come and worship before you, for your righteous deeds have been revealed for all the cities. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Today we join 
with generations of faithful believers in offering ourselves to God through the words of the psalmist. Today reading is Psalm 148. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains, all hills, fruit trees, and all cedars, beasts, and all livestock, creeping things, and flying birds, kings of the earth, and all peoples, princes, and all rulers of the earth, young men, and maidens together, all men and children. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. The scriptures inform us that full payment for our sins was offered in the death of Jesus. When Jesus was raised from the dead, God gave evidence to all that sin's power over us has been broken and new eternal life has conquered death. Let us confess our sins in light of the cross and resurrection of Jesus, our risen King. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways and wasting your gifts and forgetting your love. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue bring damage to our earth. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbors against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom of intellect and reason, and turn them into bonds of oppression. Forgive us, O Lord, for you know us well. You know that we are weak and prone to wonder. Set us free from a past that cannot change. Open to us, to us a future in which we can be changed, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and in my image through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Let's have a moment of silent prayers of reflection. Amen. God has raised Jesus from the dead as the first fruits of the kingdom. New life has begun in Christ Jesus. New life has been given to us. Forgiveness of sins is certain to all who believe. Let us share God's abundant life with others as we greet each other.
join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the scriptures that are a gift from you. We thank you that in them generations have found the means of faith. We thank you that in them our life, that they are breathed into and upheld by the Holy Spirit. Help us to tap into that today. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand that what you have for us as we receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our text today comes to us from John chapter 13 and beginning in verse 31. And when he, meaning Judas, had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the man, Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him... God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The word of the Lord. Well, when I came to the text for this week and was looking at it, I was a little bit surprised by it because it seems to be totally out of place. This is what we call the season of Easter, much like the season of Christmas. Uh, in the church world, they're not holidays that are one specific day, but they are seasons, Christmas, and then you have two weeks after Christmas that you continue to reflect on that, and Easter is the same way. Uh, the Sunday of Easter comes, and then all of the teachings that follow up to the point of Pentecost are about Easter, and so all of the texts that we've been dealing with, you've been dealing with, uh, since the Sunday of Easter had to do with the, the, Jesus and his appearances after the resurrection. So, for instance, we looked at Thomas and Thomas touching Jesus because that's something that, that uh, gave uh, testimony to the resurrection. There was Jesus eating on the seashore. Uh, and inviting the disciples to come and to join him. There was the private talk that Jesus had with Peter, restoring him back into the fold that occurred after the resurrection. There was the Emmaus Road experience where Jesus appears to two disciples and walks with them and then has a meal with them after the resurrection. There's a command for them to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit after the resurrection and then last week we looked at the shepherd and sheep narrative which has to do with the idea of eternal life which is a result of the resurrection all of these things have to do with understanding that the resurrection has occurred and here are the events that follow that that's what the whole season of easter is about and yet our text today takes us back to monday thursday and I looked at that and I thought, well, that seems really strange. 
Why in the season of Easter would we go back to the events of the darkest night in the life of Jesus and would we pull something out of it? And then as I got to studying it, I thought, well, maybe there's a reason. Maybe the people that design the texts for each year, maybe they kind of know what they're doing. Maybe there's something that is profound in this text that only in light of the resurrection can we really see it for all it's worth. Because this is the text that is really well known. It is the new commandment that I give to you, that you love one another, is I have loved you, that you love one another. And by this, everyone is going to know that you're my followers. First of all, I want you to know that this, what we call new commandment of Jesus, is not really new in the sense of loving people is new. The first testament that was written, the, what we call the Old Testament, the first testament is about love. There is no doubt about it. The commands in the first testament have to do with loving one another. In fact, when, when, uh, when somebody comes to Jesus and says, what is the most important commandment? He, he recites from the Old Testament, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That is an emphatic part of the first testament record. The prophets spell out how that love is to be lived and everything. So the new commandment part isn't that we love one another. It's that we love one another in a specific way. Loving one another, Jesus says, as I have loved you. So there's a new model for this love. There is something that the disciples are to look at, this idea of loving one another, and they're to look at Jesus, and from what they see in Jesus, it is to shape and mold this thing that we call love. It's to guide and, 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 uh, them in what they do. It's to form how they picture this love being manifested. The events of that night in which this is said, G Judas has just left. He's been announced as the betrayer. Peter is just about ready to deny. All of the disciples are just about ready to abandon Jesus. And Jesus has just washed all of their feet, even Judas. And now he's sharing his final thoughts. I think it's important that we think of this in terms of the sharing of the, like the final thoughts of someone, a loved one who has passed. You know, they're, they're kind of at the edge or they're, they're kind of approaching the, the gateway into eternal life. They're not really, not, 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 they haven't gone yet, but they're getting there. And, and there are things that, you know, sometimes they're here and, the, and they're present and sometimes they aren't. But those things that they say so often mean so much. If you think about it, this is Jesus just before his passing, sharing a final word. It would be like, you know, if, if my father were to pass and we're all gathered around his bedside and he were to look at me and his last words would say, son, I love you and I'm really proud of you. Do you think that would be important? Do you think that would be something I would like carry with me the rest of my life? Those, those words, those last words that are said, or maybe, maybe it's something like, remember, how you treat people is important. Maybe it's some, some bit of advice like, remember that your family is so important in life. Never, ever lose sight of that. Maybe it's a bit of a piece of advice or a tidbit of information that is offered. When it comes to being the last thing shared, they have a significant, profound impact on what it does to us. And here's Jesus. It's some of his final words that he's going to say, maybe the final words he says to his disciples. He says, when you think of me, when this is all over, when you think of me, remember this. Love each other as I've loved you. That has a profound impact. All of the teachings have gone on and all of the things that Jesus has done has already happened. And when it comes to the last words, the most important things that Jesus can leave his followers with, it is these words, 
love one another as you've seen me love you. By returning to the text after the resurrection, I believe that there's an element that gets added to that phrase that we don't see in real time. For instance, let's just look at the real time portion of the text. As I said, he's washed their feet. So the immediate setting of how he has loved them is to refer back to the idea that he has just washed their feet. The real time understanding, I think he does that, that that is, that is what he is referring to. It is so important. Listen, I just wash your feet. What is so significant about that? It is the one who is the most important. The one who is the, by far and away the greatest among them has just done this most menial task that is reserved for only the lowest on the totem pole. The one who is here assumes the position of being here in order to love his disciples. So I think in real terms, in real time unfolding of events, Jesus saying, love me as I've loved you, his disciples would immediately relate to the idea of how can I serve you attitude. Remember, they protested that. It was so weird to have the one who is the most worthy do the least worthy thing. And Jesus is trying to help them understand that that's what the kingdom is about. It is about people, regardless of their status, assuming an idea, assuming a posture of serving other people. I was reflecting on that and thinking about that. I think this is true. You may disagree with this, but I think this is true. The greater you are, in life, the, the, the greater your standing is in life, the more that you have in life. So your standing is great. Your place is great because you have so much. The more influence you carry, the more, the more famous you are in the sense that you're here, what you say has a hearing. The higher your calling, When you have all of those things and you're considered one of those who are maybe like a cut above, whether it be through uh, influence, whether it be through possessions, whether it be through uh, your celebrity, that the higher that, that status is, that your willingness to humbly serve people becomes that much more effective. In other words, what I'm trying to say to you is that if I was just the lonely person, the, the shoeshine boy around the corner, and I was always doing something for other people, you'd look at that and say, well, that's just kind of your lot in life. But the more that you have, the more that stands behind your name, the more possessions that you have, the greater your influence, the more famous you become, assuming a posture of what Jesus has done, the more impact it has on the lives of others. Why would they do that? I was, I was following on my, uh, on my Twitter uh, last night that one of the uh, pro professional football players who I've uh, really admired, uh, Howie Long's son, has retired from the NFL. If you follow his story, he gave his entire salary several years back to, um, to support uh, a generous cause. He personally has been responsible for 56 freshwater wells, <clears throat> I believe in Tanzania. He has been relentless in promoting the people who have nothing. And not just using his status as a football player and a famous son of a famous father to say, you all need to do this, but he has done it himself. And I was reading the accolades that were coming at him from other football players and other people. And I think maybe one of the most fulfilling things that he probably heard in all of that was, man, you were a beast on the field. But you were a double dog dare beast. 
in making a difference in people's lives. You used your position of status. You used your resources of wealth. You used whatever you had in the way of influence. And you served those who had nothing. And just one person after another lining up to say, I don't know what retirement holds for you, but I wish you well and keep it up. I guess that's what I'm trying to say to you. If Jesus can wash the feet of the disciples and then say, love each other as I've loved you, where does that allow us to go? And what does it allow us to do? That would be the real time understanding that night, them being impressed upon something that had just happened and connecting it to what Jesus said. <clears throat> but I think there's more to it when you look at the resurrection understanding. Maybe the real time understanding is how can I help you? What can I do? How can I accommodate the intrusion that you make into my personal life, my personal space? How can I turn that from being resentful to being a blessing to you? How can I become a servant to others? That would be the real time thing, but in the resurrection as you think about it and you look back at this and Jesus is saying to them, when you remember me, think about how I've loved you and love each other that way. His love goes far beyond just what had happened that evening. The post-resurrection understanding of how I have loved you shows us a Jesus who loves the imperfect and who bears and absorbs the wrongs that they do at a great personal cost and forgives and loves them with a sacrificial love. I'm sure as the disciples look back at that statement in light of the resurrection, they see a Jesus who understood the frailty of what they were as human beings. Here was a group that among them was going to betray him. Here was a group that among them was going to deny him. Here was a group that among them all were going to run away from him in his hour of deepest need. And Jesus still loves them. Here's a group of people outside of the disciples who have done their best to insult Jesus, to mock Jesus, to torture Jesus, and ultimately to crucify Jesus. And there he is hanging naked before the world on a cross saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. When you measure this statement against the darkness of the events that unfolded from that night forward through the resurrection, it tells us an amazing story. It makes this passage a powerful Easter passage. This is love marked by something other than serving, even though serving is still at play. This is not a love that's, that's just marked by serving only, taking on the servant's towel and humbling ourselves saying, how can I help? This is a love that goes far beyond that. This is a love that is marked by forgiveness, that is marked by enduring the sinfulness of others. And Lord knows we have to do that in life. This is a love that is marked by giving yourself to other people who are not worthy. Let's just look at those just for a second. Forgiveness. I'm here to tell you this morning that forgiveness is the most difficult action you will ever take as a human being. Everything in you will resist the idea of forgiveness. Everything. Because it is so difficult. It is so costly. Listen, I can hold grudges easily. I really can. I don't have to work at that. I can remember things that happened years ago exactly how they happen, with who they happen, and I can still hold a grudge over that. It takes no effort whatsoever. In fact, if I didn't have a little conscience whispering in my ear in the name of my wife, Julie, 
I would think that would be perfectly normal. She reminds me that there's something more that I need to get to. And I have to love her. I hold grudges easily. I cling to resentment very easily. If you've hurt me, I mean really hurt me, and I've become resentful of that, I can cling to that it is like Velcro. And you try to strip it off, it goes <laughs> And as soon as you let go, it flaps itself right back up. I can be consumed by bitterness very easily. Forgiveness has a cost. Because forgiveness requires that we absorb the wrong without requiring the other person to pay the price. It requires that we absorb the wrong without requiring that the other person or the wrongdoers pay the price. It is paying the price so that others go free. I think when Jesus says to the disciples, listen, when I'm gone, remember this. Love each other as I've loved you. I think they would immediately look and say, remember how horribly we treated him. And he forgave us. Remember how horribly the world treated him. And he forgave them. And he suffered and endured something. It was at great cost to him to do so. One of the great themes that always plays out in the movies that we hold dear and that we are fascinated by is that somehow people get the revenge that they seek. They even the scales of justice on their own. They make somebody else pay for what has been done. We like that as human beings. And here's Jesus saying, love each other as I loved you. To forgive is to let go. I will suffer the cost so that you can go free. It is the hardest thing that we have to do as human beings. I think that comes through loud and clear. What about enduring? You know what? People are fallen. People are broken. They're sinful. And I find it very difficult to consistently love the unlovable. You know what I mean by the unlovable. I'm talking about people who are annoying, people who are inconsiderate. I saw a person the other day, they were in the parking lot, and their car was so much better than everybody else's car that they parked on an angle and took up four units. It doesn't take anything for me to get upset about that. How inconsiderate. You're that much better. You know what I've done in the past? I have, I have changed as I've gotten older. I pulled in right alongside of them on an angle close to their door so they couldn't get in. <laughs> people are inconsiderate. People are selfish. They're self-centered. People, they're rude and sometimes they're crude and they're obnoxious. Sometimes they're toxic. It is hard to love the unlovable. <clears throat> To endure people has a cost. It means embracing them in spite of their glaring shortcomings. I just say this about it. Enduring love recognizes that others are not unlike ourselves. Sinners who fall short of God's glory. I think that's why Jesus says, if you want God to forgive you, 
you need to forgive others. Because in the long run, you're not really that much different. On the obnoxious scale, it may be lower. On the rudeness scale, it may be lower. All these things. But you still have your warts. You still have your blemishes. To endure others recognizes that they are not so much different than myself. And I expect God to love me and forgive me even as I am. Just as I am without one plea that thy blood was shed for me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And finally, I think, if you think in the terms of sacrifice, as the disciples surely would, the last thing I want you to remember, Jesus says, is I want you to love each other as I've loved you. And that was sacrifice. I think it is hard to give yourself to people without any idea of return, with no hope for gain of something in return. I find that I have energy for the most part to love people that I know will love me back. But that's not who Jesus loves. He loves people who hated him back. He loves people who treated him poorly back. I think it's hard to give ourselves to people sacrificially. There's this thing that I embraced a number of years ago that I thought, boy, Lord, if I could just get here with my life, if at the end of my life others would say about me, here's what Tom was all about. That would be this idea of living to give. Tom lived to give himself, give himself to his congregation, give himself to charitable causes, give himself to help people who were struggling outside of his own church, give himself to all of these things. It has been a lifelong endeavor that I struggle, struggle greatly to achieve. But every now and then there's a glimpse of it that emerges and I think, okay, Jesus, we did that well today. I think this is what you would have done. And I think I've loved them as you've loved me. It doesn't happen very often, but it happens some and I strive to have it happen more often. I strive to be more forgiving. I still have a former son-in-law that needs my attention in that matter. Maybe you have one like that too. I still have people who treated me poorly that I still have attention to give to them. I hear the words of Jesus saying, listen, after I'm gone, I want you to think about this. Love them is I've loved you because that is how everybody is going to know that we are Christians. Wouldn't that be amazing if the thing that stood out about us as the church, us as the people of God, is our amazing love, forgiveness, endurance, and sacrifice for other people? How could the world badmouth that? How? So I ask you, as I close my sermon, when all the layers of your onion are peeled away, you keep pulling back the onion, you keep pulling back the layers, what is at the heart of your faith? What, 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 is, your, what is the substance of what makes you tick as a believer? Is it morality? Morality is important. Is that, what, is that what your faith is all about, morality? Is it doctrinal correctness? You know, I believe certain things and that's what my faith is rooted and grounded in. Or maybe is it denominational identity or branding? The heart of my faith I am 
Presbyterian or I am Methodist or I am Lutheran or I am whatever. Or is it the heart when all of the layers of the onion are peeled away? Or is it at the heart of your faith, this idea of love? God knows we need people that that forms the very center of their being. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for words that challenge us. The last words of Jesus. Help us to live them. In Jesus' name, amen. raised from the dead and now seated at the right hand of Almighty God, let us profess our faith. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of God, God of God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, one in being with the Father. Through him all things were made who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, if our ushers would wait on us, we will receive our morning offering.
me in a prayer for our offering. God of wonder, we offer you these humble gifts, signs of your goodness and mercy. Receive them with our gratitude. Use them to further the purposes of your kingdom, both in our community and throughout our world. Amen. You may be seated. As we go before the Lord in prayer this morning, we will have the opportunity to uh, pray for our loved ones, those in our families, our friends, in the community, our neighbors who we know are hurting. Uh, our practice is that we place them in our hands and we lift them before God. We have uh, two special requests from Sandy. One is her daughter Lisa has a broken right wrist and uh, it's more than just like a little fracture. It's been a little bit of a journey with that. And also her, sis, uh, her daughter uh, Cindy has surgery coming up on her hip. And then also we will remember uh, Megan and little Ava Marie. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we um, approach your throne with the assurance that we are loved. And now, Father, as we pray, we do so as an act of love. We remember and we look to those who are in need. We first of all pray for those that have the impossible task of leading, guiding, governing, those who are responsible for the affairs of humankind, those trying to navigate all of the dysfunction of human nature, that nations might enjoy relationships with other nations, that people within nations can enjoy relationships with each other. Help them and be with them. Encourage them and strengthen them. Grant them, Lord, a heart for justice so that even the least will be treated the same as those who are the most. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for our communities in which we live. We pray for those who govern and guide, for first responders who give of themselves, who lay their lives on the line that we might be rescued and safe and kept. We pray, Father, for our neighbors, those who we live among, May we be shining lights of love that they might know that we are disciples. Father, those within the sphere of our influence, those within the care of our families, our friends, those that we love dearly, we offer up to you now these names as we place them in our hands of those who have needs. We especially pray this day for little Ava Marie. We pray for Megan. We pray for Lisa and for Cindy. We add these names to those we hold dear in our hands and we lift them before your throne, Lord God. We release them to you, asking you to come and to do for them what needs to be done. We look to you, Lord God, to bring healing into their lives. Bring refreshing and peace into their lives. Help them in their loneliness to bring compassion and love into their lives. Father, as we pray for these, we are mindful that you are an all-powerful God and that you love to hear the prayers of your people and you respond in kind. So respond this day to the, into these lives, we pray. Lord, we thank you for these things. We pray now for the end of our service. We pray for our potluck time together, the sharing of the meal. Ask your blessing upon the food, blessing upon our time of fellowship, that it might be pleasing to you, and it might be a blessing to us. These things we offer to you in the mighty name of Jesus who taught us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. beginning of the service if you make sure you come forward and gather here together so we can meet I would appreciate that let me bless you may the Lord our God bless you and keep you may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace may we be a people who others know to be disciples of Christ by our love for one another go in peace for we are Amen. Amen.